Why is metaphor so important to her, though? Because she's Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> What's left of philosophy? I'm Gil. Here with me today is Lillian. Hi, Gil. Uh, William. Hey, man. And Owen. Hey. So uh, today we are discussing some of Donna Haraway's early works. Uh, Haraway was born in 1944 and was trained originally as a biologist, earning a PhD in biology at Yale in 1972. Um, what we're looking at are a few of the essays collected in a book called Simeon, Cyborgs, and Women, The Reinvention of Nature, which was published in 1991. Uh, the three essays that I've asked us to look at were all written between 1985 and 1989. Uh, first is the one she's most famous for, the Cyborg Manifesto, but we also looked at situated knowledges and the biopolitics of postmodern bodies. So I'd like to take a couple minutes to set the scene a little bit before opening the floor for discussion. So especially with the influential success of the Cyborg Manifesto, Haraway is one of the most prominent representatives of what we can call postmodern feminism. In the 1980s, she's on the cutting edge of rethinking feminist problematics using the conceptual tools developed in structural theory, historicism, and cultural studies. And she's also deeply involved in what's come to be called science and technology studies, which subjects discourses of scientific knowledge production to critique and analysis from the perspective of their historical, material, and social political contexts. Science and technology studies ask questions like, how is funding for scientific research secured? Which projects manage to get funding? Where is that funding coming from and why? What are the implicit biases involved in our standard models of uh, scientific knowledge production? How are the claims of scientific knowledge production authoritative? And then that sort of question, I think we can hear authority uh, as both being about epistemology and politics, since whose statements are taken seriously as true knowledge turns out to be a matter of power. So during this period in the 80s, she identifies uh, as a socialist feminist, sometimes even as a Marxist, and I'm sure we're going to get into whether or not we find that convincing. On this podcast in the past, we've kind of come in hard on so-called postmodern socialism, as listeners who checked out our episode on the Cloud Moves Hegemony and Socialist Strategy will know. And that book was published in the same year as Haraway's Manifesto. So part of what's interesting for me is that in spite of that, I find her use of postmodern themes to be much more promising, and maybe hopefully the three of you can help me figure out why. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I find that her writing from this period is actually very fruitful and helpful for thinking about the relationships between capitalism, gendered reproduction, racializing discourses, technology of the body, and questions of scientific knowledge production and epistemic authority. At least part of why I think I'm less bothered by her moves in these texts is that she's very clear that her version of postmodernism involves a critique of the received notion of objective knowledge, but not objectivity as such. So her version of postmodernism is pretty far removed from the caricature of it that's still so popular, and which of course is like going making the rounds again with people like uh, James Lindsay and so on, uh, which present postmodernism as this idea that all knowledge claims are equivalently relative, there just is no truth. Her essay, Situated Knowledges, is designed to reclaim the idea of objectivity, but one where objectivity is a product of partial perspectives rather than being what she calls this sort of God's eye view from nowhere. So with her work, I think we get to keep objectivity, but only in and through particular perspectives. So she says that she's trying to elaborate a counter-rationalism, which is explicitly opposed to any irrationalism. So we have opportunities here to talk about standpoint epistemology, uh, and this is connected as well to her sophisticated and ambivalent relationship with the new powers that seem to be opened up by emerging technoscience, which I find a lot more compelling than either kind of romantic back to nature hostility to technology across the board, like we get with thinkers like Heidegger, or the extremely stupid, naive techno optimism of Silicon Valley ideologists. Um, so my last note here before we proceed is that I very intentionally selected these early works. Um, and I don't know if any of you have looked at any of her more recent stuff. Owen was saying that he watched an, a recent interview about dog importation. Uh, yeah, she was inheriting, sorry, she was uh, importing 
um, agility dogs from Taiwan. And she was giving a right. talk about it, actually. To do Great. what? Yeah, I think... <laughs> to do agil- agility <laughs> competitions in the U.S. She had it sent oh. from yeah, Taipei she- to San Francisco. Yeah, Sweet, I dude. find her more recent work is <laughs> much less promising and goes in some <laughs> troubling directions. I think what starts out in this early work that we're looking at as a kind of defensible theoretical anti-anthropocentrism, which is articulated for precise leftist and feminist political projects, increasingly becomes more and more a kind of like anti-humanist and anti-political pessimism. So I don't want to dwell on um, that later work, no, um, but I'll wait, just refer Gil, to... Gil, yeah, you don't what? think agility dogs are socialists? Is that what I'm hearing? I do not think that agility dogs are socialists. Yeah, okay. All right. I'm logging off. <laughs> I think they're feudalists, actually. They're like, they're not quite yet at the level of the bourgeois revolution. Um <laughs> I thought you were just trying to trigger me personally by assigning stuff that talks about that. (laughs) We have to get to that, how Owen feels about the animals. Yeah, yeah. I have some thoughts. So anyway, I I just wanted to direct listeners. There's a really lovely essay about this trajectory uh, by Sophie Lewis called Cthulhu Plays No Role for Me in Viewpoint Magazine. I don't want to dwell on that later stuff yet. We'll probably come back around to it. So that's kind of like setting the scene. I kind of wanted to get... Uh, that's sort of on the table and and with that done maybe we can turn to some of these early works um what did you all think could we say like what postmodern feminism is and then proceed sure it's a good idea i feel like this would be helpful for me like there's common themes um throughout the essays and some of it is very familiar like having read it you know some you know getting introduced to this work there's kind of some typical stuff that we can distinguish as like being postmodern, but I'm wondering if we that would be helpful for our listeners and maybe for us too. Yeah, I, th- I think it starts with undoing binaries, right? Which is one of the kind of classic postmodern moves, and so undoing the the kind of binaries of maybe earlier feminisms between wage labor and domestic labor, undoing or deconstructing the binary of mind and body. Uh, yes, I mean I, you could probably map a ton of uh, of dualisms onto there, but I think that the at least broadly, it has to do with trying to undo and to deconstruct some of those binary logics that might have been operative in not only in kind of the history of Western culture, but in previous variants of feminism. Yeah, I think that's right, and there's also a kind of strong anti-essentialism that kind of pervades the whole thing. You know, we got. And she's, again, not alone in this, but we get, you know, very explicit articulations in her work. She'll say things like that there just is not anything like what it is to be like a woman, essentially. Nothing in common amongst women, something like this. Uh, you know, the the classic, you know, Beauvoir, one is not born but becomes a woman is like really radicalized, I think, in a lot of these postmodern variants where there's not even like a shared kind of experience maybe that could be pointed to in what defines a woman or a man. And these, I think, are all kind of wrapped up, like Owen said, with the sort of rejection of binary or dualistic thinking. And I think, again, what's interesting about Haraway is the sort of ambivalent relationship she's got with this stuff, right? She doesn't see in it all just a kind of like ludic play of differences and it's all good. Um, She doesn't think that it's as easy as all that to just shed these binaries that have so informed so much of Western thought. She thinks it's more complicated than that. And it also seems to me that, you know, what's going on, uh, at least with Haraway's version of postmodern feminism, but I, I do realize, like, you know, there's um, Anzal Dua in the text, and around this same time, maybe a couple years earlier, uh, Can the Subaltern Speak, I think, came mm-hmm. out, was this notion of what are the terms on which solidarity happens? And I can't speak to whether, you know, the discourse that I take po- postmodern feminism to be reacting to, you know, is actually this reductive, but it was definitely a rejection of the understanding that there's anything automatic about solidarity across national borders. I think it, it rather, you know, explicitly becomes about questions of not just, you know, within the West or within a country, but what does feminism mean when it travels? Mm-hmm. And so that mm-hmm. I thought that that was probably another key feature of what's going on here. So, for instance, if, if we take a look at this line, there's a couple lines from the manifesto. Uh, And she's kind of given this kind of genealogy of her own project, like where is this all coming from? And she's citing people, like you said, um, like like Ansel Dua, but also Sheree Moraga. Um, She's talking about Audre Lorde um, and then also coming from 
the sort of science side of things, she's always referring to Sandra Harding, for instance. And she writes the following. She says, with the hard-won recognition of their social and historical constitution, gender, race, and class cannot provide the basis for belief in essential unity. There's nothing about being female that naturally binds women. There's not even such a state as being female itself, a highly complex category constructed in contested sexual dis scientific discourses and other social practices. Gender, race, or class consciousness is an achievement for on us by the terrible historical experience of the contradictory social realities of patriarchy, colonialism, and capitalism. So I think like, yeah, this, this idea that there's not a natural sort of unity to be expected or which could be uh, insisted on by pointing to anything shared by a group like women is, is part of what makes this specifically postmodern feminism. But for all that, she doesn't think that like, you know, we therefore abandon these projects of trying to come together. She thinks instead of trying to build essential unity, we need to do something like figure out how to do like affinity coalition building on the basis of a different kind of unity, uh, which might be like provisional or tactical or something. I think that there's a lot more to say about her movement from, at least the way that I took the Cyborg Manifesto, movement from coalitions around identity to coalitions around affinity. You know, in mm -hmm. my head, the way I mapped affinity is, you know, a coalition around identity can assume that there's some sort of, you know, um, even if it's not immediate, the aim is ultimate coincidence. But affinity, the way the image I have in my head is, you know, overlapping. Uh, um, spaces of commonality without assuming that you know you're going to agree on all things and it also kind of you know lowers the bar of what we're aiming at if we're looking for some sort of coordinated you know group effort social movement etc and so I thought the language of affinity was you know it really did affect the change of register of how we mm. understand these sort of um, dynamic coalitions to emerge but also it seems to me she's responding to the idea on the science studies that you know affinity is more fruitful because the changes in, in science and technology are also producing different types of subjects. That mm -hmm. I, I thought that that was also a key feature what's happening here is that even when we're talking about the category woman, we need to ask which women, where, how, in terms of what. And so there's supposed to be some, you know, uh, something really sort of elastic in this way of thinking that doesn't mm -hmm. simply fall into the trap of assuming one already knows who or what they're looking for. Right. And then it seems as though also part of the, the possibility opened up by thinking about like affinity coalition building is that it still has this sort of project structure, right? One of our favorite themes is that like the, the possibility of coalescing as a group has as part of its like condition that there is like shared shared ends shared goals which you know to go back to stuff that we've been saying in these previous episodes in her case is very clearly about like what kind of world we'd like to live in and, and what sorts of uh, relations of like power and domination would we like to see undone or, or or done away with these are the sorts of things that can allow for organizational building across the lines of identity that seem instead to be separating that can be used to separate people I just always find it fascinating to go back to these sort of like a text like this one. And again, and like thinking about like the very noisy debates that people are uh, having today about how like postmodernism just means like identity politics. And I think there's a very strong resistance to that already here in the way that Haraway is trying to get us to think about how this practically works out. Yeah, I, th I think that's visible in the in her attempt to shift from identity to affinity, because she seems to think also that identity is focusing too much on identity and organizing your politics around identity tends to kind of reify the violences and the traumas that have gone into shaping that particular identity. And she seems to want to to move away from a kind of one sidedly explanatory relationship to what. Uh, a subject position is right by that i mean okay this is how, these are this is the whole kind of history of violences and traumas through which you can understand how this particular identity or subject position was formed um, and she has a very kind of futural orientation which i really really appreciate right which is that she wants to figure out okay well that all might be true but what is the most uh, she always uses the word potent what is the most kind of potent orientation towards our subject positions both shared and individual which might push us towards new hybridizations, new collective formations, uh, et cetera. Okay, I feel like pretty complicated about this text, so I'm gonna try to explain it 
I read, so reading this, 2021 Lillian was happier reading this than I was like eight or nine years ago. And I'll try to explain why, because I think it mm -hmm. raises some of my questions. Um, when I first read this text, I read it because a feminist philosopher who was in, uh, one of my teachers wanted to discourage me from tending too much to the socialist feminist debates of the 60s and 70s. So as you all know, I have written about Nancy Fraser and um, Iris Young, and I have been variously interested in social reproduction theory and the various debates that socialist feminists have about the relationship between production and reproduction and having like a systematic understanding of gender oppression from a materialist perspective. And I was expressing an interest in these debates, and I was kind of told in a not so subtle way that it was kind of like I was engaging in very backward kind of debates. Like I was engaging in very conservative and backwards debates, despite them being politically on the on the left. And I remember feeling I, w I was upset about this. Like I remember I was it was kind of issued as a challenge, and in, in the following way: Have you read? Haraway? Like, kind of like, mm -hmm. uh, how ignorant are you that you're still engaging in these other debates when Haraway yeah, made this? Don't you know we've already settled this? Yeah, we've right. settled this. Like, we, you're, so of course, at the time I read this and I was like, I, I didn't really like being told I wanted to be ironically socialist. That wasn't something that appealed mm -hmm. to me. Um, it seemed to me that the various truths that Judith Butler so nicely laid out for us sometime later in Gender Trouble about the nature of gender construction, kind of radicalizing Simone de Beauvoir, I thought, okay, well, we didn't need to, this isn't the only resource for, for understanding that. And it seems to me like there is a rejection of a more systematic understanding of, of gender oppression that, I mean, I'm personally just not willing to let go of, even if I'm willing to let go of things that like, you know, the idea that women have some kind of essential characteristic or, or whatever, mm -hmm. because I don't think, I mean, maybe this comes as no surprise, I fundamentally don't think about politics in terms of identity, so being told that women don't share a common identity is just, it's actually not that important for me. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm more interested in like the material basis on which gender oppressions, whatever one's identity, take place. And in the 80s, you know, it's like, it's, I, to me, it's, I, <laughs> what's ironically socialist about this is that none of the material conditions that oppress women or any gender actually, like have, were actually like, like the material gains of the women's movement were so thin as to almost be non-existent. They were almost entirely mm -hmm. cultural gains mm -hmm. and in matters mm -hmm. of like formal rights. And so to be told that I should be ironically socialist in the 80s when the basis for that movement had collapsed and there was no like demands left, mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, I walked away from that first reading being like, this fucking sucks, man. Like I'll be honest. And then, mm -hmm. This time around, I was a little bit more open to it because I've overcome some of my issues, I guess. And I'll, I can say more about what I think is helpful. But I just wanted to throw that on the table, that it, I think it does depend on where you come at this from. Like, this could, like, she seems to assume that some of this is, like, very liberatory. But, like, reading this in the 2010s for me didn't feel liberatory. It felt like, okay, like, how long are we going to, like, play off of our affinities for before we say, like, we need universal child care, we need, like, health care, we need these things that were never won and that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it, let, give that to you all to... Probably. That's great. No, no that, that that's really helpful because you know, yeah. um, you know, one, I think we should also, especially for our listeners who haven't read it, we should probably say something about you know what the fuck a cyborg is. And, you know, <laughs> oh yeah. Um, like, you know, not leave our yeah. listeners with the notion that this is about RoboCop. I mean, it's not it, not it, about it, RoboCop. It's not not about RoboCop. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, but it's more Blade you know, Runner. You probably. Yeah, <laughs> Blade Runner, Star Wars, uh, shows up a lot. Star Wars was apparently really politically formative in the eighties. Um, <laughs> so I was, you know, you probably know the history better, but you know the way that I could read this is that it's almost a response to the loss of a potent base of political mm -hmm. action and is dealing with the detritus and trying to, you know, say so after, you know, what do you do after a movement has been shattered? 
shattered after you know it seems like you know the the possibility of realizing those sort of universal dreams whether it's you know child care or you know um actual you know substantive formal rights do you just simply descend into irony simply descend into well we each have our own experiences so that's that and what i thought was really fascinating to manifest she says there's some part of me that gets really tense about the idea of letting go of objectivity as such of you know descending into it's just metaphors all the way down which is you know a very sort of postmodern or deconstruction in this way of approaching things so i kind of read it in this time like that like what do you do after the failure has happened and i do read the 80s as an incredible regression for the left a lot of melancholia was setting in and it seems like a lot of the promises that, you know, one was hoping might emerge from the 60s and 70s, whether it's, you know, nationalism out, outside the West or attempts within the United States, et cetera, had fallen apart. I, it seems like, you know, the election or the elevation of Reagan was especially traumatizing for the left and that this is what this text seems to be trying to work through. Star Wars, by the way, names the missile defense system that Reagan in, in implemented. My, what, what a joke that Which is part of, was. Oh, I know. We right? are such a like ridiculous culture, honestly. We have a space force now, by the way. So We have I a space know. force. Well, and a show actually, to go with gives, it. Gives credence to her claim that like actually like what seems at first glance like a very clean cut distinction between like science fiction and social reality is actually quite a porous boundary and ignoring like the rhetorical metaphoric side of this is definitely to our detriment, right? In other words, like, the metaphor is actually doing a lot of material work, weirdly. And in the same way, like, you know, she says at the beginning of the manifesto something about how, yeah, this is like an attempt at building like a myth that's ironic, but then she also says, I think I'm being blasphemous here. And I quite like this line. She says, blasphemy always seems to require taking things almost too seriously. Right. Like, you know, no one's no one's kicked out for heresy because they're not really invested in making sure this is being done properly. And I think there's something about that that's important here as well. The sexy parts of the manifesto that everyone remembers are like maybe we should now finally define a cyborg. The stuff about how all of these boundary distinctions are crashing down. Right. And she's looking around, like you say, in the middle of the 1980s and being like, we no longer believe really in the difference between human beings and machines. Right. We've got this sort of cyborg. She says like cyborg ontology. It gives us our ethics and politics. All of us are like jacked into these weird technologies and circuits and flows of information. Where do our bodies begin and end? We don't even believe in the difference between humans and animals, all of this stuff. And that, you know, at the one hand, she's like, it's just cynical to pretend that that's not the case. And so much of like, you know, the cultural reactionaries are like, no, these divisions are still important. There is a public sphere and a private sphere. And she's like, that's just not the world we live in anymore. Well, th that's a good place to ask, though, I guess, how much we buy. And I'm curious, Lillian, based on what you just said, particularly, how much we buy the premise of this of the whole argument in the cyborg manifesto, like the premise of the programmatic part of the manifesto, which is that we in the 1980s um, were going through, and I, I don't know if we're going through it now or it's done, but we're going through a massive economic and social revolution on the scale of, you know, mm -hmm. the industrial revolution. And that, you know, she lays out those, uh, that kind of graph of, you know, all of these categories and what they meant in the industrial age and what they, and what their kinds of equivalents are now. And so I guess I'm curious how much we want to, because it's hard to get the programmatic part of it off the ground unless you, unless you buy that we have undergone a radical transformation because of informatics, because of cybernetics, because of advances in digital technology. Have we actually entered a kind of new social formation in which, because if, if it's the case that we have, then it's kind of hard to argue that, I, I think it becomes a lot easier to see the potential in the programmatic part of the manifesto if you accept the kind of historical argument. I just want to be clear, mainly for, for my own purposes, when we're talking about new technologies, we're, we're not being like metaphorical here. It seems like we are talking yeah. about like your know, uh, home computers, those big clunky cell phones, you know, those car phones and all of that. Like, you know, are we being like, is she being like literal about the, the new technologies that are emerging in the 80s that are changing yes. our notions of work, et cetera? Um, like, you know, this is obviously just a personal example and this isn't the 80s, but I remember my dad first got a beeper 
and he realized, <laughs> oh, I don't actually get to leave work when I leave at right. 4.30. You know, if mm -hmm. I get paged, I do actually have to call back. I remember the exact same thing. And so I just want to like, you know, be clear, like for our listeners, like you know, the notion of the cyborg, yeah, it sounds like a metaphor, but she seems to be wanting to say that these different technical capacities actually really do, well, we can obviously, you know, argue if we buy this, really do inaugurate a new type of social formation. And mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the, the terms of political analysis are shifted by this in a way that maybe in the 1960s, because they didn't have the same types of technologies woven into labor practices, that, you know, wasn't there. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think so. I think that it is meant to be literal. Um, and to think about, for instance, like when I, when I talk about this with my students, I like ask them to try to imagine what kind of person they would be without their cell phones. And like, you know, the point of the thought experiment is that like, I can't do that anymore. You know, there's kind of a no going back character to the implementation okay. of these literal technologies in terms of how they shape our subjectivity, our ways of making sense and connecting to others, of processing information and knowledge. And, and, and then I think that Haraway's claim is that like, this also has consequences for how we have to think about possibilities of social and political organization as well like it in the 80s she thinks is visibly transforming a lot of social relations in ways that it would be unwise just to pretend is not the case when she gives us these lists that you mentioned oh in this sort of graph where mm -hmm. on the left side we have all these like old categories uh that you know relied on all these binaries and dualisms that you know we we no longer believe and then on the right side we've got the the weird postmodern terminology that's set of categories that seems to have replaced them the first thing she always says and she does like a version of that in all three of the essays we look at and the first thing she says after that is like well notice that all the stuff on the right that is things like communications engineering subsystems optimization immunology replicators and replicants and fields of difference it's like none of that can be read as natural mm -hmm. right but actually the consequence of that is kind of retrospectively the old categories are shown to not have ever been natural either right it kind of calls into question like the supposedly natural pre-cyborg body right like there, there's mm -hmm. it's kind of i want to say both and in in some to your question right like these new technologies are making a difference but also, like, when were we ever not kind of doing this weird kind mm -hmm. of boundary, messy work of constituting subjectivity in and through the technologies available to us at a given time? I feel like I'm not super compelled by the binary she draws. I had the same reaction to, like, so here, here's what I think is true and that I find valuable before. I, I don't want to, like, be dunking on this because it's, it's an interesting text. And I, I think that what's very valuable is that the point about political subjectivity and maybe the kind of biopolitical points that she makes and how she tries to say, like, to press on our intuitions about, you know, in a very postmodern way, our intuitions about the relationship between the human and the non-human. And when we hit develop sort of like anxiety about technological changes, um, this is in some ways not, it's not responding to the reality of what our lives have in some ways always been like. And I, I like that stuff. I kind of like the ontological arguments she's making. I'm interested in figuring out like how far it goes. Like she kind of promises this like transhumanism, and and I feel confused about like at at what point it, like have we always been mm. this way, and this is just this is just what human nature is like, or is it that is there a point in which we kind of stop being human? Like is there a point in which we stop being what we consider ourselves to be? Um, and I'm not sure she really gets into that, and I and she seems optimistic about it. Like we should think of this as, as an opportunity to have some kind of utopia. I like that thought experiment. At the same time, I feel like part, a lot of the energy of this, like very, the very 1980s energy, is this like persistent set of like impressionistic diagnoses about the transformation of the social structure that like would go on in every discipline for like two decades, like every, like just redefine, like we're in a new era and there's a new kind of capitalism and we're just going to put a different prefix, prefix on it. And like what really gets eclipsed and 
creating these kind of like these columns in which was the old, there's Fordism, and then there's this new thing that's not Fordism, is like exactly what the social relationships that are actually driving those changes are entirely lost. So then you start being like, oh, all the boundaries are slipping. And I'm like, wait, is it really the case mm -hmm. that like the, the relationship between production and the household, like it is changing, but is it is it that fluid? Like, I'm not, I'm genuinely not sure. And is there a systematic way that we can understand this um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like declaring that everything is new and different? Mm -hmm. So I think the postmodern dynamic of this text, to sum up what I just said, I'm not persuaded by so far by that way of proceeding, but I think there's a whole host of other interesting claims she makes about postmodern subjectivity that are also, that are, I'm more persuaded by. Yeah, so that that's interesting because you know I took her to, you know, I, you all can press me on this. I took her to actually trying to be pushing back against the idea of like you know a complete rupture, a complete paradigm shift. I mean, I think she thinks so. You know, something has changed, but you know, even when she does those columns, you know, I, I think maybe it's in either the manifesto or um, uh, the the the, the knowledge piece where you know she says something along the line. Of, but that doesn't mean that something from a different era just like you know disappears or something. You know that you know there's always carryover. There's always imbrication. And what I thought you know she was trying to mark out was so what tools or what method can we approach social reality to see you know what has continuity and what are actually you know genuinely novel arrangements whether those arrangements are you know at the level of social agents or whether those arrangements are at the the level of how people are understanding themselves and their lives you know what are the what are the the frames by which they are talking about what is happening to them and you know trying to mark that out i see that as the being the issue of you know, sort of you know fractured identity that you know the, the almost hyper realism of the 80s or wh who's that guy Baudrillard I'm not saying everything simulacra all the way down <laughs> but you know I don't know maybe it is important maybe it's not important but it's really wild Reagan was a movie star and now oh, all of a sudden right. this is a this is a guy making policy and you know so much you know, and like, naming it after and naming it after movies yeah and so like fiction. You know, like so i wonder if this is like a strange moment for you know if i try to put myself into the place of someone in the 80s you look at them and you're just like what the fuck is going on you know well like you know, am i in wonderland now and it turns out no you're not we're not in wonderland like you know there there is you know an objective way of explaining what's going on but that's what i took her to be trying to to say just like mm -hmm. you know, what way can we approach this such that we can keep track of, you know, new changes in our social life, but also knowing that we should keep track of what remains and what persists? And I take it that's what her theory of knowledge is trying to accomplish? I think so. I also think that, like, the, like, uh, I started to say this before, like, what everyone remembers from these pieces tends to be, like, the really sexy, wild claims about how we're all cyborgs now. I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess and all of that stuff but there are moments in the manifesto for instance where she kind of does get it in down a little bit more into like the nitty-gritty like on pages 170 to 172 where she's talking about these different sort of um, spaces that um, women are occupying in all these ambivalent new ways as being modified by these technologies. And so she's talking about like the paid workplace. She discusses schools. She talks about clinics and hospitals. And she sums them all up by saying that the only way to characterize this informatics of domination is a massive intensification of insecurity and cultural impoverishment with common failures of subsistence networks for the most vulnerable. And since much of this picture interweaves with the social relations of science and technology, the urgency of a socialist feminist politics addressed to science and technology is plain. So I think, you know, there's like a, a highly metaphorical culturalist read of what she's after, but I do think she wants to play with that but also bring us back down to something like a literal materialist analysis as well and maybe it's the case by the way that part of what i dislike about the later work is that i feel like she loses that anchorage that like you know insistence on like actually we need to talk about things like what it what it looks like for households when there's like a new distribution of like who's in charge of it or the erosion of like a single fam single parent a uh, single family wage or stuff like this I was going to ask, why is metaphor so important to her, though? Because she's Catholic. <laughs> <laughs>
I was like, Good get answer. out. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's uh, it's kind of true. That's kind of right. Hey, the word became flesh. Also, metaphor yeah. was pretty hot in the eighties. Deconstruction did <laughs> okay. a lot for metaphor. You know, because I, I I ask this question semi seriously because you know I want to you know, adopt a semi critical posture to the text. Yeah. You know you, mm-hmm. uh, you know you might think you know anyone who knows me I I might be kind of swayed by the notion of talking about metaphors important, and even she mentions utopia multiple times. Oh, mm-hmm. and, you know, crossing, I did want to ask you, you know, about that how you how you <laughs> felt about utopia and how Owen feels about animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got. I we think we, I think we, yeah, we know where the Owen line is going, but I might surprise you. You know, I, I thought that there seemed to be something, you know, you know, that struck me as a bit too literary in what is going on here. That, you know, mm-hmm. the, I know it's supposed to be a sexy call of I'd rather be a cyborg. And she even describes science as utopian. Maybe we should you know, go back to that. But I'm wondering, so what does metaphor get us? And maybe, you know, in the 80s, they would say that makes no sense what you're asking. That straightforward analysis would not. You know, uh, mm-hmm. because it seems to me that there, she must think that there's some material base, material reason why she is opting for metaphors of like the cyborg and, you know, saying that we need to approach even knowledge this way. But that's not saying that there's no objectivity. But why? Why the metaphor? Why? When the world? I think one reason is that she like. Stuart Hall thinks that like of course there is like a materiality to these things and social practices but that they only have their intelligibility they only mean something in and through their cultural representations and that like at a certain level there's just no doing without metaphor hmm. um, either politically or literally I mean I think that's right but isn't it also perhaps that you know she's really kind of grasping in new territory here she's trying to make intelligible something that uh, at least at the time, there isn't a ton of work that helps make intelligible, right? And so we can, I guess, dispute the degree to which it's an impressionistic analysis of the situation in the 1980s. But I also think that, you know, when you have the emergence of like genetically modified foods, you know, as a, one example or a kind of nascent understanding that like the planetary ecology is not is no longer a natural phenomenon insofar as we mean something that's somehow independent of human activity. You know, these are big things to try to analytically grasp with, with very little precedent. And so I wonder if that, I don't know, I'm not trying to like make excuses for it because I, I see the same problem, Lillian. And um, and maybe in, in a minute it can get to get to some of the resonances of what you said with my issue with the animal stuff, but but uh, but yeah, I think part of the I mean maybe part of the, the the use of metaphors is trying to make something that is n- extremely difficult to render intelligible within the terms that we currently have or have at the moment of the 1980s. You know, it seems to me as soon you know as soon as you said that though, and I thought, well, near the end of the situated knowledge's piece, where she starts talking about eco feminism and the notion of you know no longer wanting to look at you know the the earth or nature as uh, something to ultimately be decoded, but you know she uses the metaphor of the coyote that mm-hmm, you know, nature yeah. is you know ultimately wily. Well, I mm-hmm. thought what she was trying to say here is affect a shift by of how we approach nature as simply you know, a never ending fun that we can exploit and mm. use for our purposes, or even have the dream of finally developing enough sciences by which we are going to be able to predict, control everything that happens in the natural world for our purposes, but approach it actually as you're never going to be able to fully dominate nature. That nature is not simply there for you as much as you might want it. So, you know, let me just sum up what I'm saying. Is there a normative component to the use of metaphor by which she's trying to change how we ought to approach the world even if the, the metaphors aren't about literally saying here are the material processes but she's saying how are you approaching these processes in the first place do you mean that we should like approach them you think she's saying that we should approach them less kind of conceptually the concept being like an operator of epistemic domination or something i think she wants to change how we're approaching them yeah yeah conceptually. i think that the claim is that which metaphors we use to make sense of things has actual material consequences. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, this, she's coming for instance, and in, on like the science side of things from people like Sandra Harding, from work by uh, people who are criticizing like this received model or image of what it means to do scientific knowledge production, which has without too much difficulty, you can see all these like gendered tropes about it, right? Like the, the heroic man of science, 
wresting the secrets away from a perceived feminine nature. And like the claim isn't that I don't think that like that's wrong. We need to replace it with like a, just a better concept, but that like those gendered tropes embedded in the metaphorics of how this is like made intelligible has consequences. So like another version of this that I was thinking of was like it, the, the other piece that we haven't gotten around to talking about yet. And I don't know how much we want to dig into it, but the biopolitics of postmodern bodies is all about how, uh, as she says, like immune systems discourse or immunology is like a map or a plan of action for in what she says, this like late capitalist situation where we find ourselves for navigating recognition and misrecognition of self and other. I think if we don't have recourse to the sort of like metaphoric literary cultural way of thinking that she's trying to kind of affect, it becomes very difficult to understand how like there are conceptual connections between, for instance, something like immune systems discourse as like a specific concrete thing that's happening in biomedical language and also things like, you know, political immunity um, or like thinking about like how these are actually all constructions of borders and policing of borders as like the work that this kind of discourse is doing. Right. And so mm. like, it's complicated. I, I think that it is both like has to be metaphorical, but also like with the, the proviso that like we don't mean metaphoric as distinct from the literal, which is the real. Right. It's not it's not like that, I don't think. And also, I, I guess it, it seems to me that, you know, what's going on with the metaphorical is she is even saying that metaphor allows us to denaturalize certain phenomena that we might take to be um, obvious or, you know, of course, that's the way it would be. I mean, I, I do think that there's work, for instance, in like, you know, denaturalizing the notion of borders. You know, the notion that your know, borders are something that, of course, um, happen and have no sort of a political content or political vision that orients them. So this seems to me is she's trying to disrupt the reader and show, well, a lot of these social processes in the world are formed or made intelligible by certain pictures we bring to the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we can challenge those pictures, it's not the, the claim that challenging the pictures themselves brings about change, but it might help make more intelligible different, uh, different, type, different types of worlds we could live, different types of uh, um, cooperation. Yeah, and one of the examples of that is, is to try to kind of de-fetishize uh, our obsession with nature itself, right? With kind of organic, you know, the uh, kind of with organic nature. I think like you see, you know, the, the kind of obsession with organic foods, right? And with an all natural, all natural foods. Uh, I think that the, the obsession with naturality itself is, you know, one of the things that, that she wants to, in affirming the figure of the cyborg to push us away from. Because look at how easily the kind of, the metaphor of, or, of organicism is co-opted for commercial purposes, how easily that, that particular image is exploited for, for capitalism. Are you guys aware that our bodies can mummify now because of all of the not natural and not organic food? <laughs> what? Can mummify? Really? Is it Holy because of the plastics? Fuck. Yes. Yeah, yes. like there's so much shit in your body that like when you die, there's some people who have been... I'm Mummified. going back home to the ancestors, my Egyptian <laughs> ancestors. Absolutely. That's fucking wow. rough. Yeah, that's right. Eve is part of Africa. So Don't I at me. I, I'm like with you, Owen, but at the same time, yeah. I'm concerned about the mummies. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I wasn't thinking about mummies. Yeah. Maybe that's a better yeah, metaphor, thinking about mummies. Yeah, I saw that Tom Cruise movie. Oh God! Did you <laughs> like Why? Fi like five of our listeners are going to get that Amazing. reference? The Brendan Fraser movie is much much better, obviously. So, but th this is a nice example, I think, Owen, because it gets at like the sort of way in which possibilities for social organization are opened up and foreclosed, both by like the emergence of like these new techno scientific like capabilities but also by like the governing metaphors that that like frame how we think about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So like on the one hand we have like the 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 simplest version of this is on the one hand like we were just describing this very unclear f natural fetishism and organicism, mm -hmm. right? And on the other hand we have a kind of like hypercharged like totally uninterested in anything like organic integrity 
mass agricultural practices mm -hmm. that make use of these techno scientific developments in ways that are actually extremely detrimental and right, which lead to our bodies being so full of plastic that we're, you know, walking <laughs> mummies, right? And so like, I think Haraway wants us to say like, it's too quick both to say like, you know, forget the techno science, I don't want to be a mummy, let's go back to nature. Like there's no nature to return to, but that we might need to like rethink how we, you know, put language to this stuff in order to like grasp what the actual possibilities are here. And, you know, for the purposes of like a socialist project of refashioning the world, like I can't imagine that we'll be able to like, you know, adequately feed everybody in a way that's like ethical and sustainable without the use of like, you know, these new technologies that have been devised in the past hundred years. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with GMOs. No, GMO is like a fine thing. I mean, in fact, like thing. that's a... Again, like, you know, what's weird is like the, the, the implicit presuppositions about why GMO would be bad. And in order for that to make any sense, you have to presuppose that like the organism in genetically modified organism was never modified before. Mm -hmm. And like this kind of modification of it is like essentially or inherently bad because like the integrity and self-identity and essential unity of the organism needs to be defended. And it's like, where is any of that coming from? That's not well grounded in any of these discourses. Yeah, isn't corn right. like originally from some ancient genetic modifications? I don't I mean, know. Probably. I, <laughs> but, probably. I, I, but I even think the simpler point is, you know, and you know, I have a broader point I'd like to make, is it also kind of obscures, even historically, we have been modifying our bodies for centuries. You know, whether it's, you know, prosthetics, you know, whether it's tattoos. And so the, the, the question I, I want to ask is that, you know, it seems to me or no, it's not the question, the claim I want to make is, you know, the reason why I was a little hesitant about her use of utopia is I think utopia is much more helpful when it, it, it sort of shatters our e ideological space and, you know, makes it possible to, you know, to grasp the frames. I think it's less effective when it tries to posit or to say what the new world should look like or what we're driving mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I maybe I'm, I'm I am kind of a uh, like uh, with angles on this. I'm not sure it makes sense to do that. And so the moment she's like, "Let's be cyborgs," or or I, I get we can make it more complicated, but I'm not so sure about that futural element when it shatters our self understanding. I think that that's really helpful. When you know, it denaturalizes our terms and says, you know, this thing that you thought was going on is actually happening in a different way. I think you know, when it comes to whatever a different world will look like, that will have to emerge from you know, social activity of people. This goes to more of the situated knowledge of people seeing their problems, how they affect themselves, and developing their own solutions that arise from it rather than, and thus, let's, you know, let's do RoboCop, baby. And right, again, right. she's not saying let's do RoboCop because, <laughs> by the way, RoboCop was actually a satire. So actually, RoboCop's a really progressive film about you yeah, know cops Robert using. Uh, yeah. yeah, RoboCop. Maybe we sucks. need to do a special I mean, episode awesome. on RoboCop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever happened to us doing like just for our patrons, like you know, our cultural corner, where we you know where I get you mm. all to watch Bridgerton. I that needs to happen. <laughs> Oh my god, Bridget Bridgerton is so crazy. I watched like four episodes of that, and then. I, I haven't been able to finish because there's so much cringe, but like it actually is kind of good at the same time. I don't know the what Duke to say. Duke is so hot, though. He's so hot. I actually, know. I felt kind of <laughs> disappointed because I feel like he he really outshines the female lead, which is like kind of annoying yeah. to me. Um, Agreed. The other thing that annoys me about that show, and that we can't move on, is that I thought they were just going to be like multiracial and chill, but then they like explain it to you, like in episode four. They're like, by yeah, the like, way, this is why there are black people in this <laughs> in this it's, TV it's show. So goofy. And I'm like, you could have just let it go. Just you could have just yeah. like let it yeah. let it happen. So like the I'm like, like black queen, black duke. We've got the multiracial <laughs> cast. You could have just let us have it. But then it was like, oh well, we need to. I really yeah. didn't. I I thought that wasn't ineffective move but that's no okay. completely agree <laughs> but not that we're getting off task but you know bridgerton if they just like affirm the multi-ethnic i feel like that's a cyborg right there baby like yes. you know they're mixing up binaries and saying guess what you thought the aristocracy is naturally white nah we yeah, got, let the, we hybrid, got let the hybridities people. flow let them <laughs> flow that was utopia for a second i mean in all seriousness about the the technology thing i um I feel like there's some optimism about 
technology. And I, I feel, I feel like it's, there's a, a, the materialist core of what she's putting forward is that it's not right to be reactionary against these things. Like we have developed these, you know, the productive forces in such a way that we actually have a lot of opportunities we've created for ourselves. But I do feel like it does come into conflict with some ways of thinking about climate change and ecological damage because, I mean, there's no doubt that we've developed co productive capacity such that we could all work less. We could certainly diminish our carbon transmissions or whatever. But it's also the case that, like, in order to undergo, like, development in various parts of the world, you need to develop those forces further and blow off some more coal and, and so on. So there's a way in which I think there's some tension between being good with the technology and the kinds of ways people are have anxiety about the effects of that technology under capitalism. Like it's not obvious that th these are mutually compatible visions. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. And I think that the position that I'd want to take, and which I think I see at least in some of these pieces by Haraway, is that the use made of these technologies is not independent, can't be divorced from the specific social and political context in which they're deployed. That we have, for instance, like various kinds of like green energy possibilities like before us essentially means nothing in as, in as long as we live under like, you know, a capitalist system that has no interest in implementing them when it's more profitable to burn coal. Right. And so like the the takeaway shouldn't be either technology good or technology bad, but that these are socially and politically contingent in terms of their meaning, because that determines how they'll be used. So she says at some point things like it's it, relatively early in the manifesto. She says, yeah, look, like the one what from one perspective, like, you know, living in a cyborg world is like the final imposition of like this like grid of like instrumental technologizing masculinist warlike rationality on the planet but from another it could be like the construction of a kind of world that has more equity built into it which recognizes and understands that you know we we've got this sort of connected character and which could be more more just and could be actively constructed as more just and she says that her maybe this is the irony that we were like worried about she says i think we need to like think both of these together neither of these is like the correct line to take mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to hold that sort of contradictory set of possibilities together is like important if we're going to you know try to survive it's also very interesting how often she uses the language of like survival do you think technology is like part of conversations on the left though like a, or is this another kind of area that that is just generally kind of seeded to the you know because the dominant paradigm in which i think people interpret technology right right now is a kind of Elon Musk, you know, paradigm in which it carries promises of like colonizing Mars and, you know, doing something about climate change by driving these like hybrids or something without actually altering any aspects of the, of our individual and social lives. And I just wonder how much is this, is technology even a kind of contested space, like a kind of contested problem, sorry, or contested object? I don't think it's really, at least to me, and maybe I just am reading the wrong things, but don't see it um, thematized that explicitly. Or how important do you think it is to thematize it that explicitly? I, I don't know. I, I saw something that was curious about. I, think I it take is. it that Haraway's point is that we it needs to be more contested yes. and the left can't see that ground. And I don't think we've done enough of it. Yeah. I mean, maybe I think I wanted to basically continued... suge suggest that in a question. But yeah. I think I kind of like, you know, this may be part of my like continuing fascination with an attraction to these texts is that I see that being one of the arguments she's making. And I think that that's true. Like Michael Brooks mm -hmm. would get, Michael Brooks would always get mad that, you know, he had to use YouTube and all of these various like huge kind of corporate controlled technology platforms like we do with Spotify and Apple. Uh, and that this is, and that the actual media itself and the actual technology of information dissemination itself should become an object of, um, of critique, an object of struggle, uh, should become part of our part of our politics, and that always spoke to me. It's also the case that like we are very bad at remembering that there is a material basis for these technologies mm -hmm. and information information tech. Like we're expending an incredible amount of energy maintaining server farms, for instance, which are materially comprised of circuitry and microprocessors mostly made in like, you know, S Southeast Asia for like less than poverty wages. And with like rare these are earth very metals, material conditions. With rare earth metals yeah, like exactly. violently extracted from the African it, continent. It's, 
extremely easy for us here to just, you know, go on YouTube and not think about any of that. But that material grounding is crucial. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, that's true. I feel like there's a lot of tech worker organizing that's happening at the big companies in the U.S. And I think that that's kind of important because mm -hmm. despite the fact that there's so much fascination on the left with like the margins of social life, I actually think that organizing skilled workers is deeply important, totally. not for necessarily for the for moral reasons, but for strategic reasons, although moral mm -hmm. reasons as well. Um, so I, I, I do think that that's a, th a thing that is happening um, to greater or lesser degree, the organizing of sort of uh, online media platforms, like the major uh, legacy media productions have had, you know, workers organize. Um, but that's not the sort of like, those are different than the, the kind of uh, context that you were just referring to. I also think that the debates about free speech on the platforms are uh, mm -hmm, a right. indirect way of, of talking about this because it's getting at the point of, of private ownership. And I do feel a little mm -hmm. perplexed that like I feel about the way that these companies control our access to basic liberties is very complex and confusing. And I do feel like people are too dismissive of it. And I, so I think that that's one thing dismissive of, of it being a problem. The Oh, like, oh, it's yeah. just kind of like, oh, like mm. people have a perhaps justified way of being like, okay, it doesn't matter that Twitter kicked Trump off the platform because nobody yeah, yeah, yeah. likes him and everyone thinks this is just not, <laughs> like, it's just fine because it's him, it's this one person we all hate and we don't want to hear from him anymore. But I, I do feel like... That kind of is um, the analysis, nobody likes him, and then just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, but there's a, there's a whole set of issues about, like, like what is Twitter doing with the democratic party? Like this very, this, con this perplexes mm -hmm. me enormously. I, I feel like there are very serious problems going on here, which I doesn't, I don't think there's an easy answer to what's right or wrong, but there's obviously a very strong political set of interests and problems. And, and because we have such easy access to these platforms, they don't, they're not seen in that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's the feminist debates. I think about reproductive technologies and, and so yeah. on that also go on, but that's, I think those get blown up like on the internet debates, but I, I don't think that's a real source of political organizing at this time. Although I think people think about it ideologically a lot. Um, and the, the quick thing I do want want to add, and I and I don't think we'll be able to get into it uh, uh, in this episode, is it's not just how technology is political, but what are the political ends we can put the technologies that we have now you know say mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know, why in the world are there copyrights on vaccines when right. you know if you like let those copyrights go and allow people to just you know mass produce them wherever it seems like that would be a really efficient way to solve this problem but when we're talking about climate change you know and again i'm not as well versed in all of this but you know what are on the left the analyses of the uses of technology that we have now that we're going to need to make use of if we are going to tackle this problem problem and i'm just not well versed enough in it to know what those conversations are how they're happening but it seems to me that can't just be left on the table and that could be like a provocation that you know haraway all the way from the 80s is giving us is that you can't just look at that as a tool that you can take or leave that you know it has to be a part of your political formation with something like this with like climate change you mean Yes, climate change. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, uh, so what strategies, you know, um, I know that there are, you know, really complex questions around, like, carbon capture. Yeah, because I think there is a, there is a tendency to want to be like, oh, all of these people want to, they want technology to be a panacea, but we are, like, critical of this. We understand that there are economic and social forces that are really um, responsible for climate change, and this whole, like, fetish of technology uh, is a kind of distraction from the real problem. I mean, I, I will admit to sometimes, you know, kind of spontaneously f having that reaction to people's enthusiasm about technologies, but at the same time, I also think that's kind of stupid. Like, there are is some really important thinking to be done about how it is that technology is going to be deployed in such a way. I mean, first of all, because it's probably too late just to do the, you know, let's find a, so a social and political and economic solution to this. Like we are going to need to deploy technology in a way that is like strategic and that doesn't allow those technologies and the benefits that they bring to be entirely usurped by a ruling class that has no interest in, you know, the vast majority of people's well-being. Yeah, I feel like one of the problems with even having this, like, I actually think there's a lot of answers out there already. Like, there's a lot of alter mm -hmm. alternative technologies, and there's proposals for a Green New Deal, and 
not the end of this. It's not the final final answer to these questions, but there actually is a lot out there that's available for debate. Should we be able mm -hmm. to have it? And the problem is really creating mm -hmm. a viable exit strategy for people. Like, I think this mm -hmm. maybe just goes back to our episode on, on class. Like, how do you make this avail an available option? Like, there are unions that resist this enormously because they just don't see the exit mm -hmm. strategy as being viable. And so we have to talk about a just transition and make people feel like, yeah, I can take this step with other people. This is something that I value and I feel confident in pursuing this program. And I think that mm -hmm. kind of without the, the base building, I guess, is mm -hmm. it's hard to connect the dots from, from where we're at now. But I think there actually, yeah, there actually are a lot of, like there's a lot, of, there's a lot on the table, you know? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it has to be kind of new transnational paradigms too, though, because like we need to build massive like Netherlands style. I mean, I'm not an expert on this kind of thing, but I would imagine that what we're going to need to do is to build massive Netherlands style dikes in all places, like, you know, in many places around the world, like Bangladesh, for example, who's going to pay for, who's going to pay for that? Like what kind of allocation, the global distribution of resources is going to allow for the technology for technology to be deployed in that way and in the places that that really need it um i don't know maybe i'm i'm just ignorant of where where to go to to, to read about that stuff but i but i feel like it's extremely important well maybe to kind of loop back around and come full circle to something that we were talking about before like you know one of the i think you're you're right lillian that like there are technological possibilities on the table and people are spending a lot of time working on trying to figure these things out uh, in ways that would be just and equitable. And there are political barriers to that implementation, even when we find the technology, mm -hmm. which is why I think that I like so much her insistence that like this idea of like uh, affinity coalition building maybe being like an important component here, right? Not falling back onto these sort of identity categories to try to mobilize these questions, which will definitely get in the way if you start asking questions like Owen just did. Mm. Who will pay for the construction of dikes in, in Bangladesh? Like, uh, I don't have much faith that like our American <laughs> yeah. political leadership will volunteer any of our resources for that. And yet it's like absolutely morally necessary. And, you know, however politically inefficacious it might be for someone trying to run for senator or whatever. But affinity might be a helpful category mm. for thinking about how to push that sort of organization forward. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, say this point re really quickly. And also that this question about, you know, um, transnational work about something, you know, having to do with climate change. We obviously also want to resist models where um, the action will happen by centralizing uh, all the political and economic mm -hmm. activity in, in one place. You know, there has to be a place for, you know, um, local autonomy and, you know, um, expressing and understanding one's sure. issues on the ground, but also because it's about changing the networks and power structures globally and so it, that I find that to be a really interesting tension between you don't want so decentralized that there is no coordination but obviously you don't want the distribution of resources to just be well there's this one institution in Europe that you know now is on board and it's going to unilaterally decide how things are going to happen in in what places around the globe I wanted to ask about how she argues that what is needed is a successive scientific project to the kind of hostile science that she thinks of as being ideological. And I want to ask if you guys think maybe we can pursue this in a different episode. If you think science is inherently ideological in a pejorative sense, I don't feel like she specifies. Like, obviously, we bring to the tape when we think about science or when scientists do things, they do things through certain paradigms they make certain assumptions um there's a kind of social construction of science like fine but also i worry about just like saying that science is an intrinsically ideological and a pejorative sense and she seems to not necessarily want to say that but she does make me feel like it's hard to imagine that being the case I, I think that it's more that she, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but it's more that she wants to put it negatively, right? It's not possible to have scientific practice, right? It's not possible to do science in a non-politically contentious or a non-politically, an ideologically contentious space, right? There sure. isn't, there isn't a way. So I, that's less, I think that's a bit softer of a claim than just 
science is always ideological. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because she talks about, you know, biopolitics, and I feel like the moves that, you know, Foucault makes to say that there's kind of no outside ideology, so like the idea, mm-hmm. like the concept of ideology is not useful. I feel like she's playing with that kind of set of postmodern moves, you know, like we can't get outside of our episteme. And, but she also wants to resist it. Like I don't think she's fully mm-hmm. committing to that, but the language she uses suggests it. And it just makes me like, I'm kind of partial to science, being able to not be ideological in a pejorative sense. And I'm not like there yet mm-hmm. in my knowledge of philosophy of science i just i don't really want that to be the case so i don't know if you, i spontaneously you feel that way too I, i'm there too but i think you know, the you know, and obviously these questions have been well well explored but you know there's a difference between what you know so, how scientists practice and what maybe scientists take themselves to be doing and the incentive structures around you know the scientific production of knowledge and i think we should you know, be able and willing to question the incentive structures of you know what things um, get funding how is the replication crisis being you know the replication crisis being replicated or being overcome, <laughs> and you know the right. idea that you know when you know, science does something, it doesn't necessarily you know carry within itself the normative concepts or criteria of how that information will be distributed, disseminated, and, and used. And so yeah. maybe it's not about science itself as ideological, but it's that you know science as something that is producing knowledge is buffeted by forces that we might consider outside of it, and we should be always making very clear so what are are those forces i took it to be taking even making even a stronger claim some of the time which is not just a claim about taking seriously how scientific knowledge is used or deployed but like actually the production of that scientific knowledge itself like getting deeper down to like the actual doing of the science is a political matter is a political matter Mm -hmm. and that's a much more contentious claim and to be honest one that i don't feel qualified to adjudicate but i think it is you know, I, I think it is worth at least highlighting that. That's how I feel, because I'm interested in... I don't know, she has all these claims about how we don't want to be, like, scientistic and positivist, and even though we feel more friendly towards positivism than we may in the past, <laughs> like, there's a set of, like, no-no uh, ways of thinking about social, like scientific explanation and causality and th- things that, like, postmodernists mm-hmm. are, like... We don't like these things because these things are ideological in the pejorative sense, but she doesn't fully commit to that. And that's kind of what I'm asking mm-hmm. about. Like, what is the not fully committing to that mean? Because like, I hope there's a halfway, like I would like to be able to explain things and have technology that helps us. And, you know, I, I don't think I, I, I like, you know. Absolutely. I think, I mean, we didn't really get into this. <laughs> I like Netflix. <laughs> I like, go on. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. No, look, we, we like didn't talk about it, but like this is like the, this is precisely the dialectic that I think she plays out in Situated Knowledges, right? Where she goes, look, it made very good, it made very good sense at the time for feminist critics of science and historians of science to want to pursue a, a very deflationary program with regard to science and by showing its historical, ideological kind of imbrication. And the pendulum swings too far in this telling of, this retelling of this trajectory that she's, that she's giving us, where all of a sudden it turns out that like, you know, these same feminists are no longer able to point to anything and say that that is real. And Mm -hmm. this is worrying when we're trying to talk about something, for instance, like patriarchy or capitalism, that these aren't just ideological discourse effects. These are real things with an objectivity that have to be, its consistency has to be recognized. We need to be able still to talk about it. And so I think she does want to, she wants to reclaim the sense of of objectivity and of of there being something like a scientific realism, but she just thinks it can't be like a naive realism mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. the old model that assumes that by objectivity we mean like uh, like a like I said at the very beginning this um, image she has of like the view from nowhere, yeah, right? standpoint that, like, the, neutrality. The work of, yeah, standpoint neutrality. Objectivity just means like you know the scientist context doesn't matter. Um, you know we don't have to worry about who they are or where they're coming from. They produced science with a capital S and now we have this knowledge and there's nothing further to be said. I think, you know, when she talks about things like responsibility in scientific knowledge production, she means 
attentiveness to these contexts, not as evidence that there's no knowledge being produced, but as actually being more honest about what scientific knowledge production looks like, more more sensitive to like the sort of conditions under which these discursive formations produce real knowledge that has material effects. And so like I think she, you know, there are there are very obvious examples of like ideologically um, motivated bullshit science, right? You know, we could talk very quickly, we could just very quickly mention just like, you know, the discourses on like race science, which are just totally bogus. But there's subtler ways in which science often has this sort of ideological baggage. And she thinks that, you know, that this isn't reason to jettison it. Science obviously produces extremely important and powerful, potent knowledge and resources for us. But responsible scientific knowledge production means acknowledging these contexts and that there is a politic there are political stakes to what knowledge is produced and how it's put to work. Yeah. I, think. Yeah. I like that. And I'll just say this last thing real quick. You know, but it yeah. also seems to me that what's going on there is an acknowledgement of science as also a, a social practice. What I mean by that is yes. that you know the knowledge claims it makes must be socially contestable by other scientists. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. saying like, you know, when, you know, because I could be misunderstood as saying, you know, yeah, we should all be willing to say, fuck no science. I don't believe that. <laughs> but no, the <laughs> idea that the individual scientist can even grasp some God's eye point of view, that's her language, misses that science is always this, you know, e- experimental mode of saying, here are my claims, look at my work, and, you know, I leave it to you and others to challenge it, to reformulate it and others. But if, you know, you I an ideological way of talking about science is the science says. And mm-hmm. you know when it, you know that makes science this unitary practice. You know I think you know in it, you know whether he's doing a good job or not, but like uh, in the United States, the way you know Dr. Fauci <laughs> yeah. is elevated as you know this sort of viewpoint from nowhere, etc. The avatar of science. Follow the science. science. Yeah. <laughs> Follow the yeah, about? which I even think. And like of, the American know, right, like hates him. They're like Dr. Fauci. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. and this is like the, about this and by guy. extension, they hate science. <laughs> like, yeah, like, you know, I, I'm pretty yeah. sure he's probably in some critical race theory cabal. I don't know. Totally. Oh, God. Um, no, he's paid I, by China. That's what I was told. Oh no, nice. China. Okay, I knew it was going to be that one tracks. of those conspiracy theories. But mm-hmm. even yeah. how the public understands how science is practiced, that needs that those illusions need to be stripped away. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. um, you know, the understand science as you know, a, a dynamic and ever ongoing project project that does produce real knowledge, but it's never like it reaches an end point. What would that even mean? Yeah. Oh my God, you yeah. guys, I just had the craziest thought that like the American right is like obsessed with postmodernism, but like they have like become postmodern. Like they hate science. Oh, oh my god, it's so worst. crazy. They're people. so yes. fucking nihilistic well, about science. Well, there's, the there's one Irony kink in that though. Though there's one. I'm so excited. There's, there's one thing that, that disrupts <laughs> that though, which is that they do seem to want to appropriate this knowledge. Like you saw this with Marjorie Taylor Greene this last week. They want to appropriate the follow the science uh, mantra when they're being anti-trans, right? When they're being transphobic. <laughs> Right, and then they're like, "Oh, you won't, you won't follow the science or whatever." So it is, it is. If you know, if it if if it weren't so serious, there would be something comical about watching two groups be like, you know, (laughs) trying to appeal to the authority of science for their thing, like you know, follow the science on coronavirus (laughs) and climate change, and they're like, "No, no, follow the science on on uh, on sex and gender," and it just shows you you the extent to which the science itself will not adjudicate those. Yeah. Hi everyone, Future Gill here from the editing booth. I just wanted to take a moment to clarify just that there's no confusion on this. The four of us hold that the reactionary transphobes who pull the believe science line on sex and gender are absolutely wrong about the science on sex and gender. Our point was that the right will pull this rhetorical move of invoking the authority of science whenever they think it suits them politically, but the science is 100% not on their side when it comes to trans people who deserve full rights and recognition. Episode on that coming someday. Hope that clears everything up. Thanks. If they weren't, like, that's true. It does make Haraway's point. That's a nice one, Owen. But I feel like... (laughs) (laughs) Good word well, for a yeah, good word. Why did that feel a little bit condescending, William? No, Finally but I, I, I was like... earning your goddamn keep. Yeah, you've done, you've done well. You've done Thank well you. in both Thank your you. political political diagnosis and your reading of the text. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> that's, that's, Jesus. I like it. I feel like now the American right can like descend into the hell of fragmentation that like we've been in for like 40 years.
Mm-hmm. Isn't this oh, exciting? Well, I would love it. Except One for they're, they're more, they're right? better at having a common enemy. Like that's what unites them um, more than internal coherence. But I'm really excited about the fact that they might just like collapse into nonsense because I then I can be like, ha ha. Yeah, I welcome think it, to hell. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we should look for. Well, we should we should be on the lookout for pressure points at which to antagonize them and encourage their dissolution into fragmentation <laughs> as soon as possible. Into chaos. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's going to do it for us here today. Uh, new episodes of What's Left of Philosophy come out every two weeks uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Please like and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter at Left to Fill. If you like what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash left of philosophy. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.